Great. Forgot to see that. Okay, so welcome. Uh, my name is Lara Southard. I am a senior research scientist at Pearson. I primarily work in uh, quantitative analyses and predictive modeling, statistics, you name it. Pretty much I have full flexibility and I just work in education products. Um, my background is cognitive neuroscience, so I'll be bringing a little bit of that in today uh, when we talk about visualizations. But first, I want to talk about some little tidbits that you might know or you might not know about making your code reproducible that extends beyond kind of good commenting and good formatting. So we'll start with that. Sweet. Okay, so um, I have some general tips and then I talked about Project Template at one of our meetups uh, at the Sumitas Brewery and people mentioned that they wanted to know a little bit more about the template library that I use. So I have a little, a couple slides on that. And then of course, I've written this down in my Medium blog post, uh, which is here for a link and I'm happy to share the slides. And then also that's my, my little handle there. All right, so, um, so I think about making my code reproducible at a minimum at the last step before closing on a project. I'm sure all of us have gotten like down and dirty in a project and you get all of a sudden your code is a mess and then you close it. You don't wanna look at it ever again, but you do want somebody else, especially your future self to be able to pick up your code again and then quickly and efficiently be able to read it. So typically when I started coding, I found like people suggested uh, good commenting and formatting, but I wanted to go into a little bit more detail about what I do to make my code a little bit more scalable. Um, so the first function is the paste function. Um, I use this a lot more for reports or if I wanted to put something like paste something directly into um, ggplot, but essentially it's a way to concatenate vectors uh, after converting everything to a character. So you might've used this before, but um, I think of this as a really good way. And, a, and I think about it when I think of re reproducible code because most of human errors comes from copy and pasting values. Um, I don't know about you all, but I absolutely can't stand it if I have to type a single percent. I won't do it. I'll paste it every single time because I don't want any of my values to be a mistake. Um, and I'm very prone to typos. So um, so I think R has some elegant ways to, to do that. And one of them is this paste and paste zero function. So I pulled up an example here where I just use an IRS data set that uh, most of us are probably familiar with, uh, open source data set. And the first thing I did is if you look at this species column, the species are lowercase and I didn't like that. I wanted it to be uppercase. So I just used this string to title function. Um, there's a couple different functions out there to capitalize. And then I'm pasting in um, a colon and then I am going to purposefully put a space here and here because later on I'm gonna tell paste to separate with nothing in between. And that's just the way that I decided to do it. You can do it in a couple different ways. And then I'm going to use this paste zero format because it helps with the awkward spacing that sometimes gets put around um, values when you, especially if you've done some kind of arithmetic function on there. Um, I just put these arguments in there, even though they're totally not relevant for these small decimals, but I found, found this really useful. So there's a format um, that you can put inside of paste and you can use big mark comma. So it makes things like that are in the thousands have a nice comma or big numbers have commas in there, which is nice. And then the trim equals true just takes down extra white space, which sometimes happen. I just kind of put it in there no matter what. Uh, I like to round my digits, especially if I'm trying to put out a, uh, a nice percentage or something like that, or a nice average. And then that's the actual function that created the, um, the variable, or sorry, the value there. And so now I have under group, which I named silly, but now under group, I have this nice sentence where it has each of the species and then their average petal width. And so I could just copy this and put it in. Um, you can integrate PowerPoints and, and um, uh, reports with R. So you could just have it paste that directly into one of your reports. And then I did it as distinct group down here just so I only had one row per species. So that's one way to do it. Another really nice way to do this, especially for you all that like R Markdown is to use pull. Um, so that extracts a single column. Uh, or it can just be a single value, depending on what your goals are. So for what you need to do for this is you would typically pare down your data frame to just what you need. So grab only those columns you need. I typically code in tidyverse, which I'm sure you've noticed by now. Um, I do flip between the two, but mostly these examples would be tidyverse. Uh, so you can use the select function, then perform some kind of calculation, filter it down to whatever one value or column you're interested in, and then just use pull and R will spit out this value that's here at the bottom here. 
And that's really nice if you're using R Markdown. So I'm just gonna flip to the next slide because it does have the R Markdown format for that, which is here. So this gray is the same exact code I just showed you, but now we've got just some round and formatting things in an R Markdown chunk. And this is really nice because you can actually inline code like this. Um, so I'll flip back just for a second. So R Markdown, when you do that, it won't paste the one that's just uh, part of the console there. So it'll paste this number directly into your report, which is really, really nice. Um, especially if you're using a data frame that will get updated in the future or some other time and you want to reuse that code, then you already have it in there. And so all you have to do is replace this data frame with the updated one and rerun everything and all those values should update, which makes it really nice. Okay. Uh, and on that note, something that I like to do, typically it happens when I'm done with my analysis, is I think about ways I can reduce the number of objects and data frames I've saved. And the reason why I do this is because I typically reuse code a lot in my job. Like I have um, quarterly surveys that go out. And so each quarter, I'm going to have to reuse the same thing over and over again. And it's just really nice for me to just put in a new quarter's data frame or new surveys results and then run all of my code again and just have it, maybe I might have to tweak it, but normally I don't have to. And that's really, really nice. And so instead of going through and resaving all of these different objects and data frames, I can just update one data frame and then run all of my code. And then it just spits out everything. And then I just go through and do a sanity check. And it's really, really efficient. So um, one way you can do that is just piping in your data frame directly into your visualizations or your models, which I'll show on the next slide. So that way you can see exactly what you did to the data frame before you plotted it. So it's just all right there. So this is my original one. And I've got, I normally end up with one or two data frames in my projects. So here you'd have one data frame, do a bunch of stuff to it and then plot it however you want. If, if you printed this, it wouldn't really make a lot of sense. It's kind of ugly, but the idea is the same that you can see exactly what happens to the data before it goes in. Um, I know that for base R coders, you can do that inside of the ggplot um, inside of the ggplot function, but I like to do it in tidyverse only because I can just see it really neatly here and I know there's ways to do that in base as well. Okay. So that way, instead of saving every data frame, you just pipe it into your plots and it just makes future changes much easier, at least from my experience. Do the same thing in modeling. Um, so I just used an example in Glimmer uh, or LMER as well. And I just leverage the pipe all the time. <laughs> I really like it. So here's a crude example. This would not make any theoretical sense, but this last part with data equals, you can just use the pipe and then you can filter it for every time that pedaling or pedal width is uh, greater than zero. And so you can see if you're a future self and you forgot what you did, which always happens, no matter how good you are, then you go back and say, oh, right, I was looking at this specific thing. You can do the same thing with comments, but I like to put it in as many places as possible because I never know what my past self was trying to do. Um, so I find this very helpful. Another thing for reproducible code is using set seed for any time that you have code that's going to have some kind of random process. So if you're using things like stand, um, you're going to want to set a seed. And if you don't know what that is, it's literally a random number. Most people choose their birth dates, anniversaries, or just favorite numbers. I usually go about four digits out, and then it'll, it will allow it. So every time you run that particular um, code, you'll get the same results back when you set your seed. So that's just a nice way of getting some reproducible results when you've gotten your results the way you want it. And so instead of it changing just a little bit every single time you change your model, so you don't want that. Okay, so those were my general tips for reproducible code. And then my level up, as I like to call it, um, which is silly, but that's our gamer household that we have. So our level up is um, to use library project template. And again, this is totally optional. I really like doing this. Um, I used to use this with um, a team that I had. So before this job, I used to manage a team of data scientists and researchers. And it was a really nice way for all of us to collaborate because we all had expectations of how all of everyone's code would look. And this library did it for us, which is so much better than having to format everything yourself, in my opinion. The link right here is how you get started. It's a pretty complete guide. Um, so I'm just gonna go through some general reasons that maybe will get you interested in trying it out one day or not, but at least you'll know it exists. Okay, so what the heck is this thing? It's a way um, that you can create a project. It'll automatically create a directory for that project. 
Um, and when you when it does that, it's going to allow you to easily organize all of your code. So it'll give you a place for specific files like data prep files or test files that maybe you're like, this didn't work or wasn't particularly important for this, but I want to keep it. Um, so essentially, it really helps you organize all of your data and all your scripting files. The organization can be individualized, but it's pretty clear. And so it makes it really easy to look at old, old code or share with others. And it also helps with version track, uh, tracking. Also, it integrates just fine with Git like R does in general. So you can always just go to that as well. There's a function where you can cache data frames and save them. Um, you can also do that with model results or functions. And then you can configure your project to load all of this information, including your library, so you don't have any setup, which is really nice. Uh, I'll show a little bit of that in just a second. So first to get started with R, what you'll end up doing is running the library, like installing or loading the library. And then you can use create project and then whatever you want your project to be called. And R will automatically create a directory for, for example, letters that you just set up. Uh, and then you just need to navigate to that particular directory. So I normally suggest that you create, um, you put your setting, you set your working directory to wherever you want this to be saved. So it doesn't just save into the default place. Uh, once you have done this, this is what will, it will appear under because you created the project called letters. So underneath the project, you'll have all of these different folders, which I'll explain in just a minute, that will already be created for you along with a project file, an R project file that is. So then whenever you want to load this project, you would just open the R project or you would just set your working directory to the project uh, location and then run these two lines of code and then everything would, would load in. All your cache data, so all those data frames that you want, all your functions and all your libraries, depending upon what you want. You can, you can make this individual to what you would like to do specifically. Um, then you'll have easy access to all of the data files that you might need, including like Excel files, CSV files, JSON, everything like that. And then also any of your scripting files that you want to use. So how does that actually look when we do it? So inside of these folders, this first one called cache is going to have um, your different data frames that you've saved in here or different R objects. So this is just an example. This isn't real data, um, but it, it's just a data frame that's subset. And then it has a, every single one of them will have this hash file um, for, for where they are. Then for the configuration file, I think this is the reason why I use Project Template. I love this so much. It is so, so useful for the things that I end up doing. So I'll just explain a couple different things in here because the rest of them you can always look up, but I think these are the highlights of what you want. The data lo loading uh, uh, line here, if you switch it to true, it would have everything in your data folder loaded into your project automatically. So this data folder, which I'll talk about literally next, is going to be where all your Excel files or CSV files or literal data files are that live outside of R. Next up, we have this cache loading. So if you wanted your, when you open up R, if you want everything that's in the cache folder to automatically load, then you would have that as true. So anything that's in there is, could include, again, those, those, any of those data objects. The next one that I usually think about using is the munging folder. So we'll talk about this a little bit more, but again, it will just, it'll automatically run everything in your munge folder. These kind of files are typically numbered like one through five and they're different steps, like iterative steps of data cleaning. So this is really helpful for when I um, want to drop in a new data file and then I want to load this project and have it run on that new data file. It'll just automatically do it. So I get to use like the true scripting principles of R, which is nice. And it can run everything on there, run all of the modeling that I want, and then I can go back and check it. Um, I normally like a little bit more control than that, so I don't always do that, but it is there if I want it. This is my second favorite thing that it does, and that is loading all of my libraries for me. And I just list them out separated by a comma, um, and this would be and so on and so forth. You wouldn't end with a comma. And then R will just load all these in for you so long as they've been installed before, which is really nice. And this is just a notepad file, but you can also open it in R. Um, I really like it because then add, every time I use a new library, I'll just add it to this list and then I save it. So I'm not like, where did this library come from? Why do I have it in one file and not another one? Everything's just loaded, so it's all nice and organized. All right, next up is the data uh, folder. So again, just different versions of data files that you might have. And these are made up data file names. 
And then documents, this is really nice um, because at work I tend to take um, like typed notes during meetings and things so I can save that here. So it's just kind of cool that it has that. Next is graphs. I don't typically save my graphs here, but some people like to do that. So um, I will save graphs here if I have image files like that I need to be outside of R for whatever reason. So it's just an optional location to store those visualizations. Um, lib is another really awesome uh, folder. It has that as helpers uh, R file inside of it, and it's a place to store functions that you can use to automatically load into your environment. So for example, this is um, a function I wrote for cleaning up some of the really, really messy survey data I had, and I wanted it to be able to refer to this and then use it every single time I loaded the project. And I have like probably five or six different uh, functions inside this folder and they'll all just be readily available. So it's almost like having your own little package, which is nice. And then the munging files. So in here, so this is my whole survey project. This is all my store pet files for the analysis. Anywhere I wanna do data cleaning, wrangling, things like that, just to get it in the right shape. And so these are the different steps that I do. So this one is the wrangling full because it's a mess when it comes in from a survey platform. This one is just getting the metadata so I can see the questions over time and so on and so forth. And I wanna do that every time I have new data added in. And so I can do that because of um, the con my configuration on this project, which is nice. I don't really use the profiling uh, folder, uh, but I use reports. And so here I store my R Markdown file to write up reports um, and I can re refer to any cache item, any code chunk, anything I want that's in here without any problem. Uh, so I don't have to type it all out, which is really nice. In the past, this is where I personally store my modeling scripts because I like them separate from the munging folder, especially if I want my munging folder to run automatically. I don't always want models to happen automatically, especially really big beefy ones because it'll take forever. And so that's where I keep my uh, modeling stuff separate. And then lastly, I don't know if you fail when you code as much as I do, but I sure as heck do. But then I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. I kind of want to keep that. So that's what I where I put all these uh, files and it automatically creates a test folder for me and I can put a bunch of tests in there and I actually can go back to them and see what I did or if I end up cleaning out a bunch of stuff and changing my idea at the end of my project. And so my munch folder looks totally different, but I don't want to delete all the work I did. Um, I know that Git normally has it, but some of my projects I'm not allowed to put on Git, so I'll put them in a test folder just so I can keep them. All right, so that's kind of an overview of the project and what it looks like. And so here's just a kind of a beefy example, as I wrote, um, where you can put it all together. So if you were to write up a report, which I had to do often, and I had to do a lot of inline coding because it just needed a lot of um, numbers in this report, uh, you could just go ahead and load your project to a project template and then load project straight into R Markdown. And you don't have to have all that big setup file, like you don't have all those setup um, uh, lines of code, which is really nice. And then I can just go ahead and just immediately start talking about my different data frames. So here I'm um, looking for, I think, the number of people that were in this particular group. And so I can just automatically start inline coding right into my sentences, which is really nice because then I don't have to worry about making the lovely typos I typically make. Um, and then just for fun, this is an example of poll. So here, this first one, I was able to pare down my data frame and then just run n row because I just need the full number. But here I needed a sum. So because I needed that aggregate, um, I was able to pull it here, which is what I was talking about earlier. And this was really nice because this was at my old job. And so as you can see, this was a fall 2020 enrollment analysis. So as you might guess, there was a spring 2020 and a summer 2020, and there'll be ones in the future. And so I would have to rerun this each time. And I would just update the data frame and then rerun the whole thing. And that was it. It was pretty smooth. So um, yeah, that's all of my reproducible code. And I didn't know, Lisa, if you want me to pause for questions or just keep going into the visualization best practices and do all questions at the end. You can go either way. Um, yeah, I think it's totally, I mean, I think it makes sense to stop now just to see if anybody has questions about uh, what we're doing, but, um, or what's been going on. There's so much here that I'm excited. I know you're gonna share your slides slide. after yeah. I'm assuming. But. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So you can pull yeah. and use I need this code because that's the beauty yeah. of open source. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we, I can pause for questions. So wonderful talk so far. I was wondering if Project Template has other templates than the one you just walked us through that kind of are built into that package that you could utilize. 
I would not be surprised. I had never investigated it because I liked it. So I was like, yep, this will work. I'll roll with it. But I would not be surprised if there's other templates out there at all, uh, or if there's a way to customize it a little bit differently. Um, it seems it's, it's built outside of CRAN as far as I know. It might be in CRAN now, but I'm not sure. Um, and so um, I just wouldn't be surprised because it seems like a pretty cool open source thing, but I can definitely look, I'd be happy to find out. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, no problem. It is also, it functions just like folders. So for me, like if I get, I'm like, I don't want this folder, I just delete the whole thing. Like that profiling folder I've never used, it's not relevant to me, so I'll delete it or I'll keep it and just ignore it. <laughs> it's just kind of depends. Um, great, any other questions? Okay, cool. I can Looks give like my... there's one in the oh. chat. Oh, okay, great. I didn't see it. Oh, cool. That looks like that you can create a custom one. Yep, I was not surprised by that. Yeah, awesome. Uh, yes, you can erase and deactivate the cache to run everything from scratch. Uh, and I can always add that code in there. Um, you can also delete everything that's in there if you want to. Um, so once you cache a file, you have to run specific functions to remove them out of that folder. Um, sorry, once you've cached an object is what I meant to say, you have to run specific functions to get them out of that folder or you can delete them from your expo file explorer or um, finder in any way that you typically would and you have to delete their data. Um, but if you just get them out of your global environment, they still exist in that folder, but you can delete them all with a function. I forget what it's called, but it is some iteration of remove um, that if I can remember correctly. Depending upon the size of my data frames, I typically wait to cache until the end, but sometimes I'm working with like, you know, a lot of data, like multiple gigabytes and so, or like up to a terabyte. And so I'll want to store that if I need to, based on what I'm working on or if it's a server. But great question. All right, any other questions? So we'll keep going then. And then I'm sure if there's more, we can talk about either questions at the end of the talk. I'm happy to do that. Um, all right, cool. Let's see. Awesome. So switching gears, I wanted to talk about visualization best practices. And this mostly comes out of my background in cognitive neuroscience um, and a little bit of learning that I've done with human factors. Um, so there's essentially an entire field that's concerned with how we can um, uh, visualize information or take in information the most effective way possible. And that is called human factors. So if you haven't heard of it before, it's a pretty interesting field. Um, the kinds of things that they tend, individuals in this field tend to work with is, you know, if you're paying attention to your phone, can you also pay attention to the, another thing like that cognitive load piece or, or how much uh, shared attention can you actually do and still retain information, things like that. Um, but I like to think of my visualizations with the wonderful cliche that I know we've all heard of before, which is a, per a picture is worth a thousand words. Um, and the reason why I think about it that way is because currently in our society, we typically scroll through information extremely fast. And uh, one thing I learned way back in the day when I was in grad school was that my advisor reminded me constantly that I was, I was the only one that cared about my inf information or whatever I was studying the most. Like I, I cared about it more than anyone else. So I would be the only person that would take at that much time to, to dissect it and understand it. Most people are just going to keep moving through your work. And she wasn't saying that to be rude. She was just saying that as in, you need to make sure your story pops off the page. And that was always really frustrating just because you're like, but it matters, like, look at it, it's right there. Um, but that's not always how the end user feels. And so in a world where people are moving through things really fast, you wanna make sure that whatever story it is that you're trying to tell is easy for them to grab. And so we can apply a couple principles from human factors in order to make our visualizations exactly that, just an easy story to grab. I also have a different blog post about this um, that you can refer to anytime that has a little bit more information than what I'm gonna to present today. Um, but still, still mostly what, what I'm going to present today. Okay. So I think that all of us know a bad visualization when we see one, um, and we can see that things are wrong, even if you can't name them. So for example, in this first one, um, the use of color is more or less meaningless. We're not really sure. Potentially it's because of the different groups. 
I'm not sure how these are connected because this x-axis is not something that's accessible to me, but maybe to someone else in the room that has other kinds of expertise. Um, this visualization is pretty noisy. There's a lot going on. And the, uh, the variables are sorted based on percentage instead of something that makes intuitive sense, which would be the scale. So this can be misleading. Um, and then over here, this is an absolute nightmare where 91% is, or 36% is more than half of 91% in some form or fashion. I'm not sure what's happening here. So there is a lot of wrong things. And these are wonderful visualization shared by the Reddit, the subreddit, uh, data is ugly. And it's amazing in case you're curious. Uh, and anytime that I get harsh feedback on anything, because it all happens to us, I just go and look at that and remember that I do know how to do my job. Um, but I, I thought about this a lot and realized that we, we have to think about why these are bad, but we, and we know that they're, they're bad, but are we making good visualizations or mediocre ones? And I think that's like the next step is I think most people that can code in R and are working visualizations daily, their problem isn't making a bad visualization. It's bringing their visualizations to the next level away from mediocre into something great. I picked these two visualizations to talk about some great visualizations that I think exist out there. Um, and I think they're great because they minimize something called cognitive load. So the amount of attention that you take trying to dissect what's happening. Um, but they're good. These two examples are good for different reasons. Um, but together, they both make the story jump out at you just different ways. Um, if you look at the use of color and placement and words that differ in these two visualizations, they, um, they're going to tell a much different story. So the first one uses color to drive home a point that it, it's a consistent one across time and space. So across here, we're using green and it's meaning something. Um, and it's this 961 all the way through and that 961 must be important. We can see it in distributions in time and in home price, as well as a kind of a summary over here. That's really nice. Um, the second one also uses a principle called consistency, which I'll talk about more in a minute, um, among some other good principles of human factors, but a little bit differently. Here, they're using competing colors and they're using them to convey a story of competing uh, screen time by gender, which is really helpful. So maybe typically we wouldn't use a palette like this, but in this case, it's actually helping to drive home a point, which is really nice. Okay. So what makes some visualizations better than others? Or in other words, how do we get a visualization from mediocre to great? Um, I like to think of these human, fact uh, human factors, uh, different displays. So the first one is consistency. And there we go. Um, so this is having a standard position for information. So using the same colors and features, so lines, symbols, dash lines, things like that, um, that you're gonna use them consistently throughout your visualization, so at different points in time or space, like we saw in that first visualization. The next one is going to be data to ink ratio. So the amount of ink that you are using that doesn't show data should be kept to a minimum. So using color and everything for a purpose. Otherwise, the, the reader might be left wondering, why is this here? Why is this like this? And then the next one isn't truly, like if you Google it, it's not truly human factors um, principle, but I like to think of it as one because the principle is minimizing information access costs. That's really jargony. Um, and so I will talk about it in, in extensively at the very end, but essentially we're gonna leverage cultural shortcuts so that way we don't have to have the person spending a lot of time accessing that information and working really hard on it. The short of it, if you can't remember anything from this, this particular half of this presentation is to reduce noise in your visualization. So anytime that you're producing a visualization, make it as clean as possible and make the story really, really pop, literally and that will help. Okay, so let's skip ahead just a, a little bit. My, here we go. So I wanted to leverage human factors um, to make a mediocre visualization better. I realize this is a, like, looks quite like a hot mess of a slide, but I just wanted to post the code um, that I was using to create these along the way because this is an R user group. Um, so I do apologize because it is, not the best thing, visually speaking, and I am presenting on visualizations, but we'll get there. Um, so over here, just for the, the technical side of things, um, I downloaded a library for a GM waffle on this GitHub link down here. Um, I created a fake um, data set named Diabetes, so this isn't one that um, is necessarily reproducible, but I can send it out to the group if you really wanted to recreate exactly this. Um, but on GM waffle, this um, individual here has some really great fake data sets that he uses as well. So that works also. 
Um, so this is the code I used to create this uh, visualization, which is fine, um, but it could be better. Um, there are definitely some easy improvements. And so when I read a graph, some of the first things I do is I look at the X and Y axis and I look at the colors. And right off the bat, I can see that there are problems with two of those things. So if you look down here, we've got August, December, then July, which makes no sense. And something that happens frequently in R, and I'm sure most of you have experienced at some point in your life, is you graph something and blues on top here and then blues on bottom down here. You're like, why is this happening to me? Um, and so I'm gonna fix those two things really quickly um, to make this slowly start getting into a better visualization. So I'm gonna update this guides line in my theme. I'm also gonna make some changes to the facet wrap. Um, and add a couple of other things as well, which you'll see here. So I'm just going to use factor reorder. So what was happening is it was changing this order for some strange reason, uh, but now we've got this updated based on month and year. So it goes in an order that makes a little bit more sense. Next up, um, except for this is an old, I just realized this is an old picture, so I didn't actually give you the updated picture. Um, so this is still backwards as well, but I will pull it back up in a second and show you the updated one or I think it'll actually end up on the next slide. Um, and so yes, it will end up on the next slide. Here we go. There it is. <laughs> so we'll do factory order month and year. And now we have something that makes sense. So July, then August, not what we were just looking at. And I was pointing to, uh, and then over here we have, um, high on top. So to match this actual column as well. And that was, um, created using scale fill discrete for some breaks. Um, so I kind of hard coded those in, and then I changed this, um, from reverse from false to true. Uh, and that uh, those two things, this is specific to GM waffle um, and ggplot. I think a lot of times if you just use the skill fill discrete, it'll it'll do the trick for you uh, or factor reordering. It just depends on what you want to do. Okay, so that's just two small fixes, uh, but we need to keep going because this is still not quite consistent. Another thing you might notice is that we're using the word sugar uh, and also glucose and not everyone has a biology degree or paid attention in seventh grade biology and might not know that those two things are the same. Um, and so in order to achieve consistency, um, we should be really consistent in the words that we're using and making sure things are accessible. So I just changed around some of the wording that I used in my labs function here just to make it all consistent. Uh, and just, I really like to do this in my Y axis or whatever axis has the values on it, but I put the number of blood glucose checks, use an escape key for a new line, and then said what the, each box represented, because I think that's really important. You can also put it up there, um, which I just showed for completion's sake, but either way, um, just being consistent. And now we've achieved consistency, which again is that standard position for information. So using the same colors and features. So we weren't consistent before because this was reversed. This didn't make sense. Um, this, this axis wasn't really helpful. It could have been better. Uh, and then we had those different words throughout the visualization. So that's the first part. And I know it seems small, but these little fixes are gonna amount to a great visualization or close to one. Okay, next up is data to ink ratio. Um, so in R, for some reason, they really like to give us this useless gray area. It's not helpful, it doesn't mean anything. Uh, and human factors would say that the amount of ink that doesn't show da data should be kept to a minimum. So we should get rid of that. Um, so you can put element blank in your theme for any of the places you wanna remove black lines or backgrounds, for example, like panel background, and then it'll take out this background here. And then if you strip background, it removes the facet wraps down here, which is nice. Um, you can also change the color of the facet wraps because sometimes it's helpful to help them uh, stand out a little bit. But we don't need all this extra gray. So now we have taken out the gray, we have a much cleaner look, um, or at least we're getting closer to one uh, for sure. Where we don't have all this extra noise happening in the visualization. Um, honestly, this is starting to look like Tableau, which uh, uses a lot of human factors uh, principles in order to base their templates, which is nice. Okay, we're going to level up one more time. Um, and so what I mean by leveling up with le uh, cultural shortcuts is that we have these pre-built associations and expectations. So for example, um, when you see something bright in your environment, like something red, it means to warn you, like perhaps a stoplight, like we see uh, pictured here. So we can use these kinds of things to our advantage to convey meaning without using words, which is really nice in visualization because we don't want to be too wordy either. 
So color is a great way to leverage these kinds of associations. So for my visualization, I'm going to use uh, blood glu glucose ranges. Um, the different categories are low, in range, and high. And if you don't know much about blood glucose for diabetes, low and high blood sugars are both equally but differently bad for you. So they, um, they can have different effects that are bad for the patient, um, but they are not good and it's good to be in range. So depending upon my story, I can visualize things in that way along with what, what I'm talking about. So for example, um, I could use red as a way to convey that uh, blood glucose state is out of range. So here, I wanna be really deliberate. I like to put my findings or the story in the header or the title in some way. So that way the reader um, can pull that from your visualization, the final finding from your title. So out of range glucose, uh, blood glucose by month. And then I've used um, this red color here, this dark red, and then this orange to convey that these are both potentially warnings. I realize that sometimes it can be confusing with this orange because it is um, slightly less than red. So they might think that that's not as bad. Um, so you can be really deliberate with how you wanna use those colors. Um, but part of the reason why I use these particular ones is because I checked to make sure they were accessible to a um, non like typical seeing population. So even all the way down to someone who is monochromatic, meaning that they can't see color at all, these shades of gray would still be accessible to that individual, even though that's super rare. Um, and I use this really awesome link here called Coolers uh, or Colors with two O's. And you can actually check on the different um, types of color blindness and see how your color palette holds up. Um, some are much more common than others, um, but I still like to use one that's extensible for anyone because I don't ever know who's going to be looking at it and I don't want to leave anyone out, uh, especially for something silly like that. Um, so here, this is one way that I've helped illuminate my story. And I'm right here, I'm focusing on the bad times, not the good times in this figure. Um, so it may drive you to notice that this person was out of range quite a bit, um, specifically in September. Um, but I could also flip this story and highlight the good times if I wanted to. And all that would take would be a quick flip, something similar to what we saw with that good visualization, quote, quote, good visualization in the beginning, um, where we used one color to highlight exactly what we want. And so here we're saying in range blood glucose by month. We're very deliberate again by putting our findings in the title. And then we have the high and low ranges as very light grays. And the reason for that, um, is now I'm, I, I don't mind that people might not be able to distinguish between high and low. I am not expecting my reader to be able to make any conclusions about high and low, but I want them to know that they are different, but they can pretty much lump them together because we're focusing on how often are you in range versus something that isn't so good. And this is a pretty easy way to take a look at that. Um, definitely is better than something like a pie graph because humans are innately bad at uh, detecting angles and understanding differences of angles. So using these boxes are a little bit um, more accessible for people. The reason why we want to do all of this and try to get to something really clean looking like this, not to say that this is necessarily the best visualization it could possibly be, but it was certainly better than the very beginning or the default that ARB puts out for us. And the reason why we want to do this is so we can actually put more information on there. So reducing noise is going to allow us to present more information. So these are just really simple um, uh, histograms that I created a long time ago. Um, it's just a faceted graph and it has um, two terms, summer 2019, summer 2020. It has term majors on the y-axis and then head count across the x uh, for these two different terms. And then one is the largest decrease and one's the largest increase. But because I had this nice clean look on it, my data labels are actually showing the differences between each of those terms. And I can put it on there without it looking too noisy or too loud, which is nice. Um, it also allows you to get really fancy, like doing some animations, where if you have things that are moving in time and space, um, you definitely want to make sure there isn't any other noise that would cause a problem. So here, I really wanted to drive home that starting in February and March, that this was from 2020, they had a um, eviction moratorium. And then we saw a huge split compared to previous years of people getting evicted, which is pretty obvious, right? Like because we had a moratorium, so then people aren't getting evicted. So we would expect to see that flat line. Um, and so that allows me to drive home my story, but I can be kind of fancy and have fun with it because I don't have a lot of other things going on. So that's pretty nice. So final tips. 
Um, I always try to imagine my visualization will be lifted with absolutely no context. And um, this sometimes drives me crazy because I think about it like these are so obvious to me, but I want to make sure it's actually obvious to everyone else. Um, and that that means that I have to get rid of things that might be irrelevant or even optional or anything that could be uh, misconstrued. Next, I try to reserve my captions, and this is not always true for academic papers, and I understand that, but I do try to reserve captions for data nuances instead of just everything. So I only put the things in the captions that are not obvious from the visualization. So this might include the way I filtered or gathered my data if it was different than what would be typical. If you find yourself writing out a long caption, try to challenge yourself to get this in image form in your visualization, because it really will make your visualization that much better. But it will definitely be frustrating frustrating because it, it's just as hard you think this is good and i just want to explain it anyway um, but that will help you get your visualization to the next level and then lastly use this association so we all have so many mental shortcuts think about your audience it, it, they are cultural so you have to be pretty deliberate about that and know who you're talking to but these kinds of shortcuts are posted all over the internet in psychology blogs and texts um, you can use them colors symbols um, icons and space can all be leveraged to save on word count. Um, and that's all I have for you. So, yay. Thanks for sticking through that massive amount of information. I'll, uh, I'll stop recording and we can ask questions as soon as I find it. So thank you very much.